السلام عليكم Good afternoon everybody I would like to welcome Dr. Hussein with us and we thank him for his joining and we are awaiting Dr. Tasneem for joining to share her slide and then we will start at 1.5 Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Tasneem, are you ready to start? Yes. So uh, today's um, uh, session is basically going to be three parts. Um, um, the first part is going to be the pathogenesis and, and diagnosis of, uh, of infective endocarditis. The second part is going to be the surgical uh, management or treatment for aortic valve endocarditis. And the last one before the uh, uh, trial going to be the um, surgical management for mitral and tricuspid endocarditis. It's an important topic. Um, no one wants to have uh, these cases, but uh, it happens sometimes when they're complicated. Go ahead and talk about the pathogenesis, Tasneem, please. Okay, can you see my slide? Yes, we can. Okay. So today I'm going to talk about pathogenesis and diagnosis of infective endocarditis. My objectives will be mainly about the pathogenesis and diagnosis. So for the pathogenesis, there are three main factors. 
veg vegetation formation. I'm going to talk about it first, and then host factors and pathogen factors. For vegetation formation, uh, it usually starts with uh, endocardial injury, uh, and then focal adherence of platelets and fibrin, microbial infection, and further activation of the coagulation system, cytokines release, and deposition of fibrinectin. As you can see here in this uh, picture, the first one, um, there is the colonization as a consequence of uh, mechanical injury. Uh, there is uh, first uh, sterile plated fibrin uh, complex, and then bacteria binds to, uh, binds to it and colonize uh, during bacteremia. Also, there is the release of uh, cytokines and uh, plated will be more attracted uh, to the site and will be activated. The vegetation will grow uh, furthermore. Uh, the endothelial cell will be infected and uh, will be, uh, the endothelial cells will be uh, lysed by the bacterial products and uh, uh, it will uh, lyse. The second picture, uh, the second mechanism is valve colonization as a consequence of inflammatory endothelial lesion. First, they will be activated endothelial cells uh, expre uh, and, uh, expressed by in integrin, which promote the position of fibronectin, which, uh, which is the site of attachment of the bacteria, uh, such as Staph aureus, uh, usually att attached to this protein. Then bacteria will internalize and the endothelial cell release tissue factor and cytokines causing blood clots and promote extension of inflammation and vegetation formation. Uh, then the infected endothelial cell will be lysed. So bacterial growth occurs within cells and within matrix of fibronectin inside vegetation making it difficult for host immune responses to control and eradicate the ongoing infection. Uh, some organisms with high virulence are capable of infecting normal human heart valves, like Staph aureus. Uh, there is one proposed mechanism involves the binding of Staph aureus bacteria to endothelial cells through extracellular matrix, binding proteins, and then subsequent internalization into endothelial cells. Once internalized, Staph aureus can evade the host the immune response and further activation of uh, endothelial cells and uh, induce tissue destruction. Uh, bacterial platelet and uh, um, neutrophil platelet interactions also appear to be important in the development of uh, and enlargement of the vegetation. Some pathogens like uh, streptococcus may interact with platelets to form biofilms with multi-layer architecture that are embedded within mats or tiny um, complexes within vegetations. Second thing, the host factors, which is uh, mostly uh, endocardial injury, uh, which might be due to um, central catheters and congenital or acquired uh, cardiac diseases or continuous endocardial trauma um, uh, through regurgitant, regurgitant flow or high pressure jets uh, through stenotic uh, valves. Uh, the second factor is vegetation sites. Usually from high pressure to low pressure, uh, the vegetation uh, will be uh, there. So in the pre-existing, for example, pre-existing valvular disease, uh, the atrial surface of incompetent uh, AV valves or the ventricular surface of incompetent semilunar valves, the, ve the vegetations will grow there. Or in case of VSD, the vegetations tend to, de to develop on the orifice of the defects on the right ventricular side of the opening and or secondary, uh, secondarily on the tricuspid and pulmonic valves. Uh, there is one exception in Staph aureus, uh, which can uh, adhere to structurally normal heart valves. The last thing of the pathogenesis, there is the pathogen factors. Uh, source of infection uh, that um, usually it is bacterial, usually uh, sometimes due to dental abscesses infected skin lesion or uh, infected uh, central catheters. 
or uh, due to frequent minor trauma of the oropharyngeal, gastrointestinal, or genitourinary mucosa, or in case of uh, IV drug users, usually contaminated material or uh, contaminated equipment or the skin surface of the injection site. Uh, microbial uh, adherence um, organisms typically associated with endocarditis have the capacity to adhere to bulk tissue, which includes staph aureus, uh, staph uh, uh, streptococcus viridens, and enterococci, and pseudomonas aeruginosa. Uh, bacteria, bacterial adherence to a platelet fibrin uh, complexes involve um, complex interaction of microbial cell wall components. Uh, regarding prosthetic valve endocarditis, the pathogenesis, uh, there are two uh, types, early and uh, late. For early infection, uh, less than um, 12 months post-op, uh, the microorganism reached the prosthetic valve via direct intraoperative contamination or via hematogenous spread during the initial days and weeks after surgery. Early after valve implantation, endothelization uh, of the valve sewing ring, cardiac annulus, and anchoring sutures has not yet occurred. Therefore, organisms have direct access to the prosthesis annulus interface and to paravalvular tissue along suture pathways. And uh, these structures are coated with host proteins such as fibronectin and fibrinogen, which uh, the bacteria can adhere to. And the paravalvular abscesses are particularly common with prosthetic valves because the annulus is commonly the primary site of infection involving both mechanical and bioprosthetic valves, especially, especially in uh, early uh, prosthetic valve endocarditis. And then going for late infection, which is more than 12 months post-op, it resembles the pathophysiology of uh, native valve endocarditis. As the sewing green sutures and adjacent tissues become endothelized uh, following valve replacement, alterations in the surface and flow characteristics of valve leaflets may facilitate deposition of microthrombi, which composed of platelets and fibrin, on the bioprosthetic uh, leaflets and the anchoring stent of bioprosthetic and mechanical valve. These microthrombi serve uh, as uh, uh, hospitable surfaces for organisms to adhere. So the pathogens associated with late um, uh, prosthetic valve endocarditis tend to be bacteri bacteremic isolates able to survive serum bacteri bactericidal activity and adhere to this microphombi and are similar, similar to those inducing uh, native valve endocarditis. Uh, with time after surgery, the paravalvular tissues become endothelized and are somewhat protected from infection. Therefore, unless the infecting organism is Staphylococcus aureus or another highly virulent or invasive pathogen, the paravalvular tissues are less likely to be affected in late uh, prosthetic valve endocarditis. So accordingly, late onset infections are less often complicated by paravalvular abscess and valve dehiscence and are more commonly restricted to the sewing ring or the bioprosthetic leaflet. Uh, next, going to non bacteria thrombotic endocarditis. It is characterized by the deposition of uh, small sterile thrombi on the leaflets of the cardiac valves, usually one to five millimeter, single or multiple vegetations along the line of closure of the leaflets or crust. Uh, histologically, they, are, they compromise uh, blunt thrombi that are loosely attached to the underlying valve. They are not invasive and do not elicit any inflammatory reaction. They can be the source of systemic emboli that produce significant infarcts in the brain and heart uh, or elsewhere. Uh, usually with uh, seeing with patient, patients with cancer or sepsis, it uh, frequently occurs uh, concomitantly, concomitantly with deep vein thrombosis, uh, pulmonary embolism, or other findings suggesting an underlying systemic hypercoagulable state. The second part of the presentation is going to be about the diagnosis of infective endocarditis. 
Uh, first, the clinical manifestations. Uh, there is uh, acute and subacute. Usually, the acute uh, is rapidly progressive and more severe um, if, um, presentation. And subacute usually uh, can be low grade fever, non specific symptoms uh, with uh, chronic uh, symptoms. Uh, the most common symptom is uh, uh, the, the most common manifestation is fever up to 90% of patients. And is usually associated with chills, anorexia, and weight loss. Uh, patients with infective endocarditis, they typically have continuous bacteremia, regardless of whether fever is present. Uh, other common symptoms like uh, malaise, headache, uh, myalgia, arthralgia, night sweat, abdominal pain, and dyspnea um, are common. Cardiac movements can be heard in 85% of patients. Uh, particularly, can be present in 20 to 40%. Uh, of the patients. There are relatively uncommon clinical manifestations that are highly suggestive of in infective endocarditis that include genoa lesions, uh, which are non tender erythematous macules on the palms and soles, which can be seen on the picture on the left side. Oslar nodes, they are tender, subcutaneous uh, nodules mostly on the pads of the fingers and toes. Uh, which may also occur in the thinner and hyperthinner uh, eminences, which seen in the second picture. And rough spots, they are exudative uh, edematous hemorrhagic lesions of the retina with pale centers. So they are white spots, uh, hemorrhagic uh, uh, with white center, can be seen on the last picture. Moving on to the diagnosis, uh, the modified Duke criteria. There are major criteria and minor criteria. For the major, um, uh, mainly are two uh, positive blood cultures. The second is evidence of endocardial involvement. For the positive uh, blood cultures, uh, typical uh, organisms um, consistent with infective endocarditis from two separate blood cultures. Uh, Staph aureus and uh, Streptococcus viridens and Streptococcus uh, Gyroliticus and Hasek group and community acquired uh, enterococci. Or uh, if there is a persistently positive blood culture for organisms that typically causes infective endocarditis with at least two positive blood cultures from blood samples drawn more than 12 hours apart. And for organisms that are commonly skin contaminants, uh, three or uh, a majority of more than four separate blood cultures with first and last drone at least one hour apart, or a uh, single uh, positive blood culture uh, for coxiella, bonetti, or uh, phase uh, one IgG antibody with titer uh, more than one to uh, 800 ratio. Uh, the second uh, is evidence of endocardial involvement uh, with positive echocardiogram uh, for uh, positive echocardiogram for vegetation or abscess or new partial dehiscence of prosthetic valve or new valvular uh, regurgitation. For the minor criteria, uh, the predisposition uh, or risk factors like IV drug use or uh, predisposing heart uh, condition like prosthetic uh, valve and uh, fever of uh, more than uh, 38 uh, Celsius vascular phenomena like major arterial emboli, septic pulmonary infarcts, mycotic aneurysm, intracranial hemorrhage, conjunctival hemorrhage, or genuine lesions, immunological uh, phenomena like glomerulonephritis, osler nodes, rot spots, or rheumatoid factor, microbiological evidence, uh, positive blood cultures that do not meet the major criteria, or serolog serological evidence of active infection with organism consistent, consistent with infective endocarditis. So after, uh, after uh, the echo findings and blood cultures, uh, the diagnosis can be definite, possible, uh, infective endocarditis or rejected. Uh, uh, for establishing the diagnosis. So for the definitive, uh, the definite infective endocarditis, there is the pathologic criteria and clinical criteria. 
for the pathologic um, criteria, uh, the pathologic lesions, vegetations, or intracardiac abscess demonstrating active endocarditis or histology, uh, on histology, uh, or microorganism uh, demonstrated by culture or histology of a vegetation or intracardiac abscess. The clinical criteria, um, there are uh, two um, to, to have definitive diagnosis of infective endocarditis. Uh, we have to have two major clinic, clinical criteria, or one major and three minor, or five minor clinical criteria. For possible uh, infective endocarditis, the presence of one major and one minor, or the presence of three minor clinical criteria. Uh, for rejected, uh, rejected in, uh, infective endocarditis, um, uh, there should be another diagnosis, resolution of clinical manifestations occur af uh, after this um, the four days of antibiotic therapy, or there is no pathologic evidence uh, of infective endocarditis found at surgery or autopsy. And the uh, clinical criteria for possible or definite infective endocarditis are not met. So, um, for diagnosis of infective endocarditis, the first uh, test should be uh, trans uh, thoracic echo. Uh, it should be performed in all patients with suspected, suspected endocr uh, infective endocarditis. The sensitivity is around uh, 75% and specificity approaches 100%. TE has higher sensitivity than TTE with uh, more than 90% uh, sensitivity and is better for detection of cardiac complications such as abscess, leaflet perforation, and pseudoaneurysm. Uh, in some circumstances, it is re reasonable to forego TTE and proceed to TTE, TEE immediately. And the specific specificity of TEE is not uh, 100%, and the uh, false positive findings can occur with cardiac tumors, neural thrombi, or fibrous uh, strands on the aortic valve. TEE should be done in these circumstances uh, if there is negative or technically inadequate TTE with high clinical suspicion for infective endocarditis. And uh, second, the, um, uh, secondly, is positive TTE with concern for presence of intracardiac complications, as mentioned before, and positive TTE and significant valvular regurgitation to determine the need for surgery and presence of cardiac device like pacemaker and persistent fever, even without new murmur or bacteremia. So this, uh, this algorithm shows the, uh, the TTE. Uh, uh, all patients with the suspected, suspected infective endocarditis should un undergo TTE. So if TTE was positive, uh, correlation, uh, correlate echo findings with microbiology data to establish diagnosis. If there is higher risk uh, clinical or echocardiographic uh, feature at present, uh, you should pursue to TTE for detection of complications. If uh, no clinical uh, manifestations, uh, uh, no need for TTE unless clinical status uh, deteriorates. Uh, if TTE was negative from the beginning and uh, there is low risk uh, or low suspicion of infective endocarditis, we should pursue alternative diagnosis. And uh, if there is high risk or high suspicion of, uh, for infective endocarditis or difficult imaging candidate, uh, TEE should be done. If it was positive, uh, correlation with the, the, with the clinical manifestation to establish the diagnosis. Uh, if it was um, indeterminate, uh, we should repeat TEE approximately uh, after one week. And uh, if it was positive after that, um, with clinical manifestation, we would establish the diagnosis. And if it was negative, we will pursue uh, alternative diagnosis. Uh, if TEE was negative, um, uh, we would pursue another uh, diagnosis and etiology and treat accordingly. Uh, other investigations which can be done in, for patients like ECG, uh, it should be performed as a baseline and uh, to monitor. Uh, we needed uh, like serial ECG to 
monitor uh, the progress the progression of the disease if there is any heart block or conduction delay uh, which uh, might be a clue to paravascular extension or uh, or for example if there is uh, uh, evidence of ischemia on ECG it might suggest the presence of uh, embolia to the coronary circulation uh, also chest x-ray to detect septic pulmonary emboli infiltrates uh, heart failure and uh, potential alternative diagnosis and uh, CT chest abdomen and pelvis can be useful um, to evaluate for sites of metastatic infection like uh, splenic infarcts and renal uh, infarcts however uh, it should be uh, after careful history and clinical assessment and lastly dental evaluation for all patients should be done These are my references. Any questions or comments? Anybody has any questions for Tasneem? No one has any questions. Should I ask and see if people are awake? So if you have a tissue valve or mechanical valve, um, where do you think the infection localized? Let's start with the mechanical valve. Anyone knows? Depends if it was acute or subacute. Okay, if it is subacute. Uh, I mean, uh, if it was early or late. If it was uh, late, if it was late, it would be on the um, because it, there is already endothelialization, so it should be on the leaflet. Uh, the also, I leaflet, mentioned that. Yeah, I meant I meant this question actually to the audience to see if they're awake or no. But uh, I know that you might you know better. But um, um, so, which valve do you think is going to be on the sewing ring, and which valve do you think is going to be on mo more of the leaflets, tissue or mechanical? Uh, if no one, tissue, go ahead. Yes. Okay. Go ahead, this one. Right. A mechanical valve, I would imagine that the sewing ring would uh, uh, have the infection more like more likely to have the infection there. But for tissue valves, probably the leaflets themselves. That's true. That's right. So, um, what type of bacteria uh, associated with early prostatic valve endocarditis? Anyone knows? Staph or strep? Usually staph aureus. Staph epidermidus, staph aureus. Okay, how about late? Late streptococci more than uh, staph. Okay, that's very good. So anybody has any questions at all? Uh, yes, Dr. Hussain. What about the dental clearance uh, pre infective uh, endocarditis uh, surgery? Is it mandated or because sometimes infective endocarditis will be uh, a uh, uh, critical case? Uh, so what's your insight in there? Yeah. So for the dental clearance, um, this is something people are doing uh, for all valves in general, uh, despite uh, and endocarditis if it's present. So this is just to prevent endocarditis in the future. So almost most of the schools does that, especially if you have aortic insufficiency and people normally, if it's not acute, they tolerate that fine. But if it is um, um, acute, then there is no place for it. And normally the ventricle is not set <clears throat> to tolerate the the hemodynamics uh, for this, um, um, uh, if, it's, uh, if it's aortic valve uh, or um, in the mitral position 
mitral valve um, regurge. But in the aortic stenosis, people are more careful <clears throat> in general uh, to take the patient uh, to the dental clinic, especially um, some of them that are not in the same hospital. Uh, we don't have a clinic here at Medina Cardiac Center in the same um, uh, center. They have to go to another hospital, which is very close, but uh, they go a little bit far away from us. And if they're having aortic stenosis, especially very severe or critical stenosis, and they use, they, they basically got uh, any procedure, then they might uh, basically have issues uh, with hemodynamics, uh, if they, um, they they might become unstable and you can't get them because the cases that uh, have significant stenosis and left main, you usually you worry uh, about anything happened uh, at them uh, at the time of induction um, uh, in the in the OR, or if you send them somewhere else and they have significant pain and they got tense, uh, maybe uh, they might have some issues. So for people with severe or critical stenosis, normally we don't uh, send them, but for AI and patients who can tolerate going to the, doing the procedure, um, um, uh, that they can do that fine. Um, I did see few schools, the dental clearance is not part of their protocol at all. For example, in Halifax, for example, they, it's not part of their protocol at all, but I, I trained in uh, Ontario as well as Alberta, and, uh, and this is something routine. No one uh, will go without any clearance for valve issues. Uh, but um, in general, it's a, it's a routine practice for almost uh, most of the centers to just uh, avoid any complications afterwards and remove any, any teeth that uh, are having problems. Sometimes you just check and if there is no issues, then you're cleared, you're fine. Fair enough, Dr. Hussain. Thank you. Thank you. If uh, nobody has any questions, then um, would you go to the next uh, session or do you want to take a break and come back to the next session? I'm, I'm not used to this. I got uh, informed actually last night that I'm going to be uh, part of this. And if there's any staff available with us and wants to add anything, he's welcome. But I have a few questions afterwards. Uh, after the second session, uh, session and third session that might have more discussion. If anybody has anything, uh, welcome. So you would like to start uh, from now or uh, you would like to- take, Your routine. Uh, okay, our routine you... will, will take a uh, break minutes? for at, at least 10 minutes. Perfect. Then we will let's, start again. Let's 10 minutes and come back at 1.45. Is that reasonable? Yes. It's okay. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dixon. Well.
Welcome back uh, again. Uh, now we will uh, continue with uh, Dr. Abd Rahman for uh, aortic valve endocarditis. Go ahead, Abd Rahman. Uh, okay. <clears throat> so, uh, Salam alaikum. Today I'll talk about the surgical treatment of the aortic valve endocarditis and the guidelines. So, this is a brief introduction. Uh, early diagnosis, as mentioned by Dr. Taslim, is extremely important to avoid a devastating complication, include acute heart failure, cerebral plism, and death. During the last decade, uh, infective endocarditis becoming a surgical disease, more than half of all patients have been operated on during the active phase of the disease. So <clears throat> microbiology of the aortic valve endocarditis depends on if the affected uh, valve is a native valve or a prosthetic valve, uh, is it a hospital acquired or community acquired? Uh, so as mentioned, staph aureus and staph evidence, the most common cause for the native aortic valve. Uh, regarding the prosthetic valve, uh, it's classified as early, less than a year, or late, more than a year. Early infective endocarditis, most commonly caused by uh, step epidermidis and staph aureus, as well as uh, enterococcus fecalis, where the late infective endocarditis is more commonly caused by streptococci and um, staphylococci. So the treatment, uh, appropriate antibiotic treatment is most important aspect of the management. Timing uh, is important because destruction is progressive and disintegrated Cusps do not heal or regenerate. Um, antibiotic therapy should be started soon after obtaining at least two blood cultures from different sites. Uh, the initial choice of antibiotic is based on the clinical circumstances and the suspected source of infection. Uh, the patient must be watched closely for signs of congestive heart failure, coronary or systemic embolization. Uh, daily ECG and frequent echo performed during the first two weeks of the treatment to watch if there is an increasing the aortic regage, enlarging vegetation, recurrent temporisms, paravalvular abscesses, uh, heart block, or poor response to clinical symptoms. Uh, to the antibiotic surgery should be immediately considered. It is better to operate on patients before they develop complication such as the intractable heart failure, cardiogenic or septic shock, uh, heart block extensive aortic root abscesses or stroke. So indications for surgery will start with the heart failure. If the patient having a severe acute regage or valve obstruction of fistula causing refractory pulmonary edema or cardiogenic shock, uh, this case should be taken as an emergency case it's a class one level P. Uh, in cases of severe acute regage or valve obstruction with pre persisting heart failure or echocardiographic signs of poor hemodynamic tolerance, early mitral closure or pulmonary hypertension, as well should, this case should be taken as an urgent. Um, in cases of severe prosthetic dehiscence with severe regurgitation and no heart failure, this uh, should be taken as an elective class 2A. Uh, in cases of right heart failure, secondary to severe tricuspid gauge or poor response to diuretic therapy, this case should be taken as an urgent or elective. This is regarding the first indication, which is heart failure. Second indication for surgery is uncontrolled infection. Uh, in, ca in cases of formation of abscesses, uh, false aneurysm, fistula, enlarging vegetation, or persisting fever and positive blood cultures more than 7 to 10 days, not related to uh, in extra cardiac uh, causes, infection caused by fungi or multi-resistance organisms, or in cases of prosthetic valve endocarditis caused by staphylococci or gram-negative bac bacteria. Uh, second, the third indication, which is the prevention for uh, embolism in cases of native or prosthetic valve vegetation, uh, endocarditis with a large vegetation more than 10 millimeter 
following one or more embolic episodes despite appropriate antibiotic therapy or in cases uh, of a large vegetation more than 10 millimeters with other predictors of complicated causes like a heart failure or persisting infection or abscesses formation uh, or in cases of uh, isolated very large vegetation more than 15 millimeter uh, or in cases of tricuspid valve vegetation which is more than 20 millimeter So uh, preoperatively, coronary angiography is recommended in patients more than 40, but there is an exception uh, for such a cases where the patient should be taken uh, to the OR emergency uh, as an emergency case or a large aortic vegetation so we can avoid embolization. Um, full <coughs> neurologic uh, evaluation and CT or MRI of the brain to exclude mycotic aneurysms or to visualize if there is any stroke and uh, to determine if it is a, an infarct or hemorrhagic uh, ischemia. So it is reasonable to delay the surgery up to three to four weeks if the cause is a hemorrhagic stroke or two to three weeks if the cause is ischemic stroke. Uh, but it is reasonable as well to perform early surgery in a non-hemorrhagic non stroke with a strong cardiac indication. So the surgical treatment will starting with the median sternotomy. Uh, intraoperative TAE is a mandatory to evaluate the valve. Um, so uh, patients who uh, need an emergency or urgent case, uh, surgery, they often a sick patient with a congestive heart failure symptoms and signs. For that, a reasonable and uh, it is an important to have a myocardial protection. So we'll, we're gonna use an anti-grade and retrograde blood cardioplegia um, and repeat retrograde cardioplegia every 15 to 20 minutes. The right atrium is routinely opened and can relate the coronary sinus for the retrograde uh, cardioplegia. So avoid unnecessary cardiac manipulation before arresting the heart. So we're gonna avoid uh, embolization through a transverse aortotomy one centimeter uh, or more above the right coronary artery, the aortic valve is exposed. If the infection is limited to the cusp, complete removal of the valve and implantation of a biological or mechanical valve prosthesis is reasonable. So uh, reconstruction or replacement. Uh, in cases of a native valve endocarditis, an infection is limited to the cusp or leaflet. Repair is performed whenever it's possible. It's a class one. A simple valve replacement um, is required. The choice of the valve should be based on the normal criteria, which is age, life expectancy, comorbidities and expected uh, compliance to the anticoagulation. So uh, it is reasonable to avoid mechanical valve in patient who experience an intracranial bleeding or suffered major stroke, although there is no evidence that a pyoprosthetic valve is better than a mechanical valve. So uh, if the infection is invasive beyond the cusp or leaflets, radical resection of all infected tissue and foreign materials, prosthesis, bridges, and sutures is removed uh, necessary, followed by a reconstruction. As you can see here in figure A, this is a uh, prosthetic valve with a vegetation around this swing ring. Uh, this is the same patient with a perforation to the right atrium at the arrow sign. So after, um, Debridement, we can see a destruction in location of the AV node and involving the right atrium. <clears throat> so after a full uh, and complete debridement of all infected tissue, the right atrium is reconstructed with a autolo an autologous pericardium patch. And as well, they use here an allograft uh, is tied down and will seated in the LVOT. So to understand the pathology and the anatomy of the LVOT uh, must be understood for complete surgical debridement. 
uh, and reconstruction, especially in the prosthetic valve and uh, advanced endocardial, uh, infected endocarditis. So after extensive debridement, an LVOT should be intact for anastomosis of the allograft. So the LVOT here uh, is sized with a Hager dilator uh, and an allograft with internal diameter of two to three millimeter, less than the diameter of the annulus is chosen. So this is, I think, uh, what did you talk about? Uh, LVOT is preserved to allow direct anastomosis to the um, allograft. Uh, allograft with internal diameter of two to three millimeter less than diameter of the annulus is chosen. The coronary patterns should be well mobilized. When patching the requ required, a, an autologous pericardium is chosen. So in a small uh, defect, we're gonna use an autologous, a fresh autologous pericardium. And in cases of a large uh, defect, uh, better to use a glurt uh, aldehyde puvin bricadium. So <clears throat> when uh, destructive uh, destruction extending into the intervalvular fibrosa or prosthetic valve, mitral valve patching defect after resection of the necrotic or inflamed area before prosthetic valve is implanted is favorable. Uh, sometimes the pulmonary uh, autograft has been used as an alternative to the uh, allograft in a young patient. So post-operative complication, it's uh, common after a surgery for the infective endocarditis. Uh, septic patients may be uh, hypotensive and may have severe coagulopathy and bleed excessively after prolonged uh, bypass. So after extensive debridement and uh, allograft root reconstruction, surgical bleeders must be controlled before protamine administration. And after administrative the protamine, the field uh, must be packed and suction avoided for 20 to 30 minutes for clotting to occur. So um, radical debridement of invasive disease would periaortic cellulitis and necrotic tissue and abscesses may in itself cause a heart block. So a permanent pacemaker will be needed postoperatively or, or an epicardial lead during the operation needed. A multi-system organ failure may develop uh, postoperatively. A, a rapid reversal of renal dysfunction caused by immune complex Glomerulonephritis has been observed before. A neurological deterioration in pre existing cerebral embolisms, metastatic abscesses, especially in the pulmonary, splenic, and hepatic sites. Large abscesses needed to be uh, drained out. And in cases of splenic abscess, uh, it should be, uh, splenic should be done to avoid rupture. So the clinical results. The prognosis depend largely on when and what stage the disease uh, is diagnosed, the offending microorganism, and how promptly it's treated. The surgical results depend on variable, including patient's characteristics, timing of the surgery, virulence of the organism, whether the affected valve is a native or prosthetic valve, and whether the infection has extended into and beyond the valve annulus. A prosthetic aortic valve endocarditis had a worse prognosis than patient uh, with a native valve uh, endocarditis. Nosocomial infection are associated with a higher mortality than the community acquired infection. Um, I think I forgot to add the, uh, the um, international core Cooperation of uh, uh, endocarditis prospective cohort study, where it's an international and multi central database on patients with conferred endo in infective endocar endocarditis. Uh, it reported on clinical presentation, etiology, and the outcome of infective endocarditis. Um, report about 2,500 patients, where it showed that the infective endocarditis was in a native valve. 
uh, in 72% of patients and prosthetic valve in 21% and a pacemaker or ICD related in 7% of patients. Uh, I think one fourth of the patient had a recent health care exposure. But the, the interesting thing that it showed uh, a mitral valve was infected in 41 and aortic valve infected in 37.6. The staph aureus uh, was the offending microorganism in 31% of all cases. Stroke was diagnosed in 16% of the patient. Uh, congestive heart failure was diagnosed in 32%. Paravalvular abscess was in 14% of the patient. And the surgical treatment was common for the entire cohort study on a 48% of all patients. Uh, the overall in-hospital mortality was 17.7% 17, uh, of all patients. So this is a brief talk about the surgical guidelines uh, regarding the aortic valve infected endocarditis. Uh, thank you for listening. And if there's any questions. Thank you, Dr. Abdurrahman, for your uh, presentation. Abdurrahman, uh, good job. Um, so, no one, if anybody has any question, please go ahead. If you don't, I'm going to ask. Seems nobody has any questions and they understood the topic very well. So, um, Abdurrahman, timing Hello. of surgery is very important. Um, would you support early operating on patients or late operating on patients with infective endocarditis? Would you have any preference? Uh, yeah, uh, so timing for surgery depends on the circumstances of the patients. Um, so in such a patient with the uh, ischemic insult, especially hemorrhagical uh, stroke, uh, better to delay the surgery three to four weeks. Uh, not like a, a, an ischemic stroke where we can take the patient uh, in cases of strong cardiac indication. Um, and regarding the guidelines, uh, as well, if the patient is um, having a brain insult, uh, we need to involve the neurology and neurosurgeons to make the decisions. So uh, it depends on this patient circumstances for the timing of surgery. Excellent. So yes, uh, you mentioned this uh, very clearly in your presentation, the um, uh, hemorrhagic stroke and large ischemic, ischemic stroke. These are the two things that you would delay three to four weeks. Uh, the small ischemic stroke, you can operate early, but as a general rule, I mean, people are, um, uh, talking uh, recently about the early intervention versus late intervention. Yeah. Uh, and there is a, a study um, uh, came called EASE, EASE trial. Have you heard of it? EASE trial, uh, but you mean by the uh, international cooperation of the endocarditis, right? Different. It's different. It's basically oh, no. a trial that they randomized um, the patients. Uh, um, the, the issue is not a very large cohort of the patients, like the total were, were like 76 patients of um, an early intervention versus a late, not, not late, just conventional intervention. The, they call the early is something that happened within 48 hours. Okay. And conventional, normally these, as you know, these patients, they will stay in hospital and they will take their course of antibiotics and some people would, ask for a negative um, blood cultures before they operate on these patients. There are people who yeah. prefer uh, to delay the procedure rather than doing it early. So the uh, primary point uh, was basically death and um, emboli. Uh, and that was less in the patients who uh, underwent uh, the intervention early uh, than mm -hmm. late. But the sample size is not is not big, so 
we can't rely 100% and make a conclusion out of a small study, but the trend is basically going towards early intervention is better than late intervention uh, to, uh, for the infective endocards, because as you mentioned in your presentation, the more you wait, uh, the more destruction of the valve, of the, valve, of the yeah. structures and having more complications, uh, you know, um, mm -hmm. so this is something that uh, you have to be uh, aware of. It's, this is an excellent presentation. Thank you both for you and, uh, uh, and Tasneem for, for doing this. Anybody from Thank the you. audience has anything to add or they want to talk about something else? Yes, Dr. Hussain. What about the exposure for the, the valve during surgery? Because Abdurrahman, he mentioned for transfer uh, uh, incision. Uh, is that adequate enough to get a full exposure or, or if we go for uh, usual uh, incisions? What's the difference? Yeah? Okay, so uh, he's talking about aortic valve. So um, normally uh, you do the aortic valve as you normally do uh, to replace it or repair it. And normally some people would do a hockey stick incision. Some people, they do a transfers incision and they go all the way down. They leave a little bit, a little bit of the valve. Uh, I normally just go transfers like about one and a half centimeter uh, above uh, above the RCA um, and uh, you go down and take a look because this is uh, gonna depends on um, uh, how much destruction you have. If you only have an endocarditis that only happened in the you know, leaflets, uh, the, the LVOT is fine, no issues, then you're gonna just take the leaflets out, clean everything and then replace the valve and that's gonna be adequate. But for the cases that you have a destruction in the LVOT and sometimes extends down to the mitral valve and uh, the trigones are involved, then uh, a most um, 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 detailed oh, no, I mean, I can, I mean, exposure has to happen. And David procedure, if you heard of it, and carbon tape procedure uh, as well, where they basically just go all the way down and uh, basically uh, just place a patch down to the ventricle and uh, up all the way because all that area is destroyed. So they use uh, a bovine pericardium to, to reconstruct the area or even more extensive procedure where you use a commando operation where you basically just go through the um, 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 non-coronary sinus all the way down to the leaflet, uh, to the annulus and extend your incision to the roof of the left atrium where you basically open the whole thing as a book and then after that you i mean especially if you have um, an issue with the lvt as well as the mitral valve so you need to do both and the area is destroyed so you have to basically just remove the aortic uh, mitral leaflets and uh, the root you use a patch uh, which is um, like two sides uh, part of it gonna basically close the atrium and the other part uh, after you replace the mitral uh, gonna be part of the mitral valve and gonna be part of the aortic valve and the rest gonna be used as part of the aorta. This is a more extensive procedure. Uh, I don't know, some of you guys might saw the commando operation and some of you might not saw it, not very common, but it's very extensive operation. So it depends on the pathology and how much destruction you have uh, to have an exposure. Thank you. Hey, another another yeah. thing I forget to mention in cases of a prosthetic valve, uh, prosthetic aortic valve endocarditis. In cases uh, if the root and the annulus are preserved after debridement, uh, it is reasonable to use a new prosthetic valve. It's either mechanical or tissue valve. But if the annulus is destructed and the in, uh, the infect, uh, infection is invasively involving the uh, the annulus. Uh, so the aortic root and aortic reconstruction and replacement is required and better, favorable to use an allograft uh, more than the prosthetic valve. Yeah, that's 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 very good point. Yes, I agree with you. And uh, some people they do a ROS procedure for these uh, cases as well. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, it's it's very it's very I mean depends on what what you need to do. 
uh, and the homograft or allograft that you mentioned is, is, is the one that people are using very often. Uh, but um, uh, I agree with you, uh, it's going to be enough uh, to use uh, a homograft and it's better for, for the infection. So, but not, it's not available everywhere uh, and it's expensive. So not every center mm. has, has a, access to this. So. Yeah. Thank okay. you so much. No problem. Anybody has any questions? If you don't have any questions, we're going to take a break for uh, 10 minutes and uh, we're going to come back uh, at uh, 2.22. Is that reasonable? Okay. Yeah. Thank you.
Welcome back again to the third lecture with Dr. Hammam. Can you share your slide, Doctor? You can start, please. Assalamu alaikum. Today I'm going to talk about mitral intracasbid endocarditis. Uh, mitral valve infective endocarditis is one of more devastating complications of mitral valve disease. And Sorry, Doctor. You are not sharing your slide. Okay, I'll try again. Now, is it clear? Yes, go back from the start, please. Okay. Today, I'm going to talk about in surgical management of mitral and tricuspid endocarditis. Uh, mitral valve infective endocarditis is one of the more devastating complications of mitral valve disease. And if it is left untreated, it is fatal. The predisposing factor is a degenerative valve disease, a prosthesis valve, and intravascular prosthesis or device, hemodialysis line nosocomal infection, intravenous drug, and immunosuppression. Uh, repair valve have a low risk of endocarditis compared with the prosthesis valve. In native mitral valve endocarditis, uh, it begins with an endocardial uh, injury, which allows for the position of fibrin and platelet with subsequent attachment of bacteria, which will lead to the native in, in mitral endocarditis. In a prosthetic uh, valve endocarditis, uh, it's rising number of patients, uh, but it is uh, more common in Nordic than in mitral because majority of mitral valve are repaired inst in, uh, instead of uh, replacement. Uh, in management, we will divide it to medical treatment and uh, intervention. This is in 2021 in American Heart Association guideline for medical treatment. Uh, Recommendation is class one, in patients with infective endocarditis, an appropriate antibiotic therapy should be initiated and continue after blood culture with guidance from antibiotic sensitivity data uh, and the infective infectious disease team. Uh, core one, patient with suspected or confirmed infective endocarditis associated with drug use should be referred to addiction treatment for opioid substitution therapy. Class 2A, an inpatient with infective endocarditis with evidence of cerebral embolism or stroke, regardless of uh, other indication for anticoagulant, is reasonable to, to be in temporary discontinue for an anticoagulant. Uh, class 2B, inpatient with left side uh, infective endocarditis caused by the streptococci or enterobacter or staphylococcus aureus uh, or, or coagulase negative in staph. Uh, patient is supposed to be in demand and multidisciplinary team after initiation of antibiotic. So they have to change this in uh, intravenous antibiotic to oral antibiotic therapy and maybe consider if TE before to switch to oral therapy to show no paravalvular infection or remnant. Uh, core of evidence in uh, 2B in patient with who receiving a vitamin K antagonist anticoagulant at the time of infective endocarditis diagnosis, they have temporary to discontinue vitamin K antagonists anticoagulant. Uh, it's harm with patient with known valvular heart disease should not receive an antibiotic before a uh, documented blood culture are obtained for unexplained fever. Uh, intervention and recommendation. Uh, decision about the time of surgical intervention for infective endocarditis should be made by a heart uh, valve team and patient with infective endocarditis who present with valve dysfunction resulting from symptom like a heart failure or early surgery during uh, initial hospitalization and before com completion of full therapeutic course of antibiotic is indicated and patient with left side infective endocarditis caused by uh, Staphylococcus aureus or fungal or organism or other resistant organism, early surgery during initial hospitalization and before completion of full therapeutic course of antibiotic is indicated. And patient with infective endocarditis complicated by heart block, annular or aortic abscess or destruct destructive penetrating lesion 
uh, early uh, early in, in initial hospitalization uh, before com completion of a full therapeutic course is indicated uh, in patient in Yeah, in patients with infective endocarditis and evidence of persistent infective as a manifested by persistent bacteremia or fever lasting more than five days after onset of appropriate antimicrobial therapy, early surgery uh, is indicated. In all patients with definitive endocarditis and implanted cardiac electronic device, uh, complete removal of pacemaker or defibrillator system, including all lead and the generator is indicated. For patients with prostatic valve endocarditis and uh, relapsing infection, dividing as a recurrence bacteremia after complete course of appropriate antibiotic and subsequent uh, negative blood culture result, without other uh, identifiable sources of infection, surgery is uh, recommended. In patients with recurrent endocarditis and continuing intravenous drug use, consultation uh, with addiction medicine, uh, with addiction medicine is recommended to discuss the long-term prognosis for patients differing from action. That the risk reinfection before repeated surgical intervention. This is considered two uh, A in patient with uh, infective endocarditis who present with uh, recurrent emboli and resistant vegetation despite an appropriate antibiotic therapy. Early surgery is reasonable. To be impatient with native left side valve endocarditis, so exhibiting vegetation more than one centimeter in length, with or without clinical evidence of emboli, may be considered. To be impatient with infective endocarditis uh, and indication for surgery who haven't suffered from stroke but have no evidence of intracranial hemorrhage or extensive neurological damage, be considered. For patient with infective endocarditis and major ischemic stroke with extensive neurological damage or intracranial hemorrhage, if patient is hemodynamically stable, delaying valve surgery for at least four weeks may be considered. Timing of surgery, in most cases, the operation should be not be delayed once the surgical indications are present. There is exception in this situation in people with, uh, uh, with a stroke. If it is an hemorrhagic stroke, better to delay surgery for one, one or two weeks, uh, sorry, for three to four weeks. If it is an uh, ischemic stroke, better to wait for one to two weeks. If he has an uh, ischemic stroke, but it involves a large area in brain, and there is uh, worry about this if to, to transfer to hemorrhagic stroke, uh, better to wait for three to four weeks. There is an ACE trials uh, to include in 76 patients with left side endocarditis. It's a randomized study to early versus and late surgery. Follow up, it was in six weeks. The primary endpoint, in it was in hospital death or embolization. Uh, to where like an, an early, uh, 3% was with early and 23% 23, uh, 23 was with late, so there is a superiority in uh, an early uh, an early intervention with the uh, infective endocarditis in mitral valve. Secondary endpoint in ACE trials was in death, embolization, and recurrent infective endocarditis. Uh, it was superior for early uh, early intervention. Was it, it was in secondary endpoint was in three percent in early intervention and twenty three percent in late intervention. A limitation for this study, uh, most of patients, they were in low risk patient with low rate of uh, staph infection. Operative technique, general principle, a radical deployment with removal of all infected and necrotic tissue, foreign material is must, but it's difficult to accomplish in mitral cases with AV groove, infusion, necrosis, or abscess formation. Uh, we will divide uh, we will divide in uh, surgical technique to anterior leaflet repair, posterior leaflet repair, and uh, reconstruction of trigons and annulus. With uh, anterior uh, leaflet repair, in the kissing lesion of uh, anterior mitral leaflet uh, with uh, endocarditis can be repaired with an pericardium. Uh, the patch of, a patch of pericardium is sutured to the remaining of tissue. 
of anterior leaflet with the running suture. There is a more extensive destruction involving in both aortic valve and anterior leaflet of mitral valve. It can be repaired by using a freestanding aortic root allograft with anterior leaflet of mitral valve still attached. Uh, the allograft attached to aortomitral curtain can be used for reconstruction of the base of native uh, anterior mitral valve. In case of posterior uh, leaflet repair, uh, the middle scalp B2 segment, the posterior leaflet is frequently affected by uh, infection process. Uh, repair can be divided to triangular and or quadrangular resection of middle scalp. Uh, sliding repair is useful in the in, in the in the close uh, to, in the case of an uh, all posterior wall uh, or posterior leaflet uh, perforation. We can use a sliding repair technique. Extensive destruction for posterior annulus require a removal of all necrotic tissue and annular restriction with uh, pericardium. Repair of annulus and posterior leaflet can be accomplished by with the same patch if the cordial support to the leaflet is good. Any patch need to be uh, suture and suture line must be tension free with running suture 4-0 or 5-0 are used in the entire patch. If replacement is required, mechanical or bioprosthetic uh, may then be maybe then inserted after this uh, repair on the same trigon patch. Uh, we will go to the prosthetic valve uh, endocarditis. The approach for prosthetic valve endocarditis it's better to go via median sternotomy and to do one preoperative CT if it's available. Uh, other alternative technique is in right uh, anterolateral uh, thoracotomy. Mitral valve exposure usually approach to mitral valve via the right atrium or atrial septal. Reconstruction of uh, reconstruction of mitral annulus. Once the exposure of mitral valve is obtained, the infective prosthesis is removed, and the annulus is debris of all old suture material and bleached it with mitral valve. Uh, prosthetic endocarditis may can produce a separation of left atrium and left ventricle with the prosthesis. In this situation, the operation includes a deployment of uh, annulus with subsequent annulus reconstruction using a uh, 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 pericardium batch. Uh, with this technique, we can, we can do a semicircular pericardial batch to reconstruct the mitral annulus. Finally, the reconstruction of fibrous trigon and intravalvular uh, uh, fibrosa. In the case of extension of uh, prosthetic valve endocarditis into the intravalvular fibrosa or fibrous trigon, maybe we are maybe we, we have to when replace in both mitral and uh, aortic valve. This usually occur in the setting of uh, uh, prosthetic valve endocarditis affect, affecting both an aortic and mitral valve. Mitral trigon, sorry. The constriction of intravalvular fibrosa as well as the replacement of both an aortic and mitral valve are required in these uh, circumstances. With the uh, fibrous trigon may be reconstructed with uh, pericardium. Uh, perfect in exposure is mandatory for both aortic and mitral valve. Uh, this approach allows deprivement of aortic and mitral valve allows as in the fibrous trigon. The prosthesis mitral valve is then swing normally to the annulus. The superior portion of mitral valve annulus is reconstructed with pericardial batch that can support and replace the intravalvular fibrosa. Uh, again, this batch, it work like an anchor to the mitral valve annulus and, uh, and then swing, a swing ring of prosthesis is far enough back where the mitral annulus is still preserved. The batch is made, made like a sandwich between a mitral valve suture bleeded it and annulus uh, on the ventricle and the ventricle side. Once the mitral valve is secured in the place, the aortic valve prosthesis is, is fi fixed in the aortic annulus uh, posteriorly to the pericardial batch, and we can cover any defect in the annulus with the intravalvular fibrosa. And the lateral uh, coronary can be re-stenosed again in the aortic valve. It's a complicated uh, surgery, 
I don't know if did they do it before. I think it's just like an uh, case report for this reconstruction of fibrosis, uh, fibrosis trigon and intrafibral fibrosis. Post-operative antibiotic treatment, uh, regardless of mitral procedure, the patient have to complete at least for six weeks of uh, antibiotic therapy. Uh, patient with fungal uh, endocarditis, the patient have to receive this medication as oral antifungal for lifespan. And tricuspid valve uh, endocarditis, uh, it's a right-sided infective endocarditis, less common than left side. It, uh, it represents 5 to 10% of cases of uh, endocarditis. Staph aureus is predominant because it's for organism and tricuspid valve endocarditis. And the rising of uh, MRSA increases this uh, issue. Risk factor, intravenous drug user, cardiac implanted uh, device infection. In cardiac implanted device infection, lead infection is increasingly important cause of tricuspid valve endocarditis. Infection should be considered separate from tricuspid valve endocarditis in that the majority of uh, cardiac implanted device infection are localized to the device pocket and should not be considered a tricuspid valve endocarditis. Third most common uh, risk factor lines, hemodialysis, hemodialysis lines, permicath lines, it approximate, it accounts for approximate like in 10% of infective endocarditis. Medical treatment for uh, right side infective endocarditis is good. Non operative management with only antibiotic, it's clear in bacteria for more than 80%. Uh, associated with only 7 to 11% of hospital mortality. Uh, surgical treatment, surgical indication for an uh, tricuspid valve endocarditis if vegetation is more than two centimeter and recurrent septic uh, pulmonary emboli with or without right heart failure. Infective endocarditis caused by microorganisms that are difficult to be eradicated like a fungal and uh, Staphylococcus aureus. Right failure uh, secondary to severe tricuspid regurgitation with poor response to diuretic uh, therapy. Finally, we have in three, uh, three classic option for uh, tricuspid endocarditis uh, treatment, surgical treatment. Uh, first, tricuspid valve repair can be accomplished in most cases, even those with extensive valve destru uh, destruction using a variety of techniques, including uh, autologous uh, bricardial batch augmentation of destroyed leafment or implantation of an annual plastering and expanded uh, cordae. The second one, the classic one is tricuspid valve replacement. Uh, it doesn't matter if it is what the kind of valve and it remains in contraversal. contraversal uh, Long-term survivor is uh, similar, regardless if it is a prosthetic use or uh, native valve. Last one, this is an old uh, technique. I don't know if they can use it nowadays. This is a complete excision of tricuspid valve without prosthesis replacement. It is uh, described by uh, like in 50 years before. It is in two stages. Uh, first, they will uh, remove the entire tricuspid valve, but supposed to be the uh, pulmonary artery pressure and vascular resistance are not elevated, this one condition. Uh, but the issue is more than 60% of this patient with tricuspid valve uh, excision, after uh, six months, they will come with ascites and peripheral edema and low cardiac output. That's it for today. Thank you very much, Hammam. Excellent job. Um, anybody has any questions to Hammam? Either you did a good job or nobody understood anything. One of those. I think the first one. Okay. <laughs> okay, so um, I think it's very clear you covered uh, almost all the um, aspects of this. And uh, tricuspid valve um, endocarditis, people are very hesitant to operate on these patients. and. It's, it's different from place to place uh, where 
for example, in the West, uh, IV drug uh, uh, abuse is is very common, and people when they have that, they come back again and again uh, for um, surgery, and people are hesitant to operate on them. And some institutions that have protocols to offer these patients one time of surgery, of course, after um, um, the addiction team. Uh, you know, counseling and if things, if they think that this patient is real, reliable and he will continue doing the good things, then maybe they will uh, do it for him one time and then they don't take him again. But uh, if you operate on the trachospid valve, normally these patients, they come back and the second operation is very difficult normally with, uh, with these patients. So if anybody has no questions, then... Um, We'll um, give you guys a break uh, before you go to the very important and the landmark trial, Laos trial. It's a very, very important trial. Everybody should know this. It changed the guidelines. And um, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a nice one. It started in McMaster uh, University um, uh, by um, one of the famous uh, surgeons there, uh, Dr. Whitlock is the principal investigator for this and he's a he has an extensive experience and um, uh, if you don't have anything now we'll probably take a 10 minutes break and then come back for uh, the that trial and uh, i think uh, uh, the person the person who's going to look uh, after this is uh, dr um, haytham uh, and then the presenter going to be sultan and uh, my phone is almost dead. Uh, thank you so much uh, for having me today and wish you good luck. And uh, hopefully we'll, uh, we'll uh, talk to you guys again. Thank you, Dr. Hussain, for your uh, uh, company to us and uh, for valuable comment. We thank appreciate you, your uh, presentation.
خليفه ايوه Are we starting soon? Or? Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Sultan, you are around. You can start, please. Assalamu uh, alaikum. Can you see my slides? Or? Not yet. Okay. I'll try to get a moment. Is it clear now? Yes, it's there, but uh, not in not in show. Uh, yeah, now it's yeah. okay. Bye. Uh, Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Sultan Askar. I'm a cardiac surgery resident at uh, Prince Sultan Cardiac Center Al Hassa. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about left atrial appendage occlusion during cardiac surgery to prevent stroke. This uh, presentation is supervised by Dr. Haytham Pahani, consultant cardiac surgeon at Prince Sultan Cardiac Surgery Al Hassa. So, a quick overview atrial fibrillation is the most common sustained arrhythmia worldwide. The lifetime risk for developing atrial fibrillation in individuals aged 40 and above is one in four. And it, it, this condition is responsible for about 25% of ischemic strokes. A lot of these ischemic strokes are cardiogenic in origin. And many of these cardiogenic strokes uh, originate from the left atrial appendage. Uh, classically speaking, oral anticoagulation is an effective method of preventing or reducing the uh, risk of developing uh, ischemic stroke and uh, arterial systemic uh, thromboembolism. However, there is a major setback with these drugs is that the most uh, common one is non-adherence, poorly controlled INR, or underdosing in some cases of patients. This is where the left, the Laos trial came into play. There were two studies, two pilot studies that I'm not going to focus on today. I'm just going to be mentioning them. I'm going to focus on the Laos 3 trial. So the first one was the uh, result of a randomized controlled pilot study of left atrial appendage occlusion during coronary artery bypass. This study involved 77 patients. 20, 52 patients were randomized to the occlusion group and 25 were in the control group. They came up with a conclusion that uh, left atrial appendage occlusion at the time of cabbage is safe. However, they needed a much larger trial to determine its, its efficacy in preventing uh, ischemic strokes. The second layer trial was conducted uh, also to uh, to uh, to test the feasibility of a larger trial to be uh, to be performed at a later date. They, they performed two studies, a cross-sectional study and a randomized study. The cross-sectional study was of 1,889 patients. They were, this cross-sectional study was undertaken to determine the risk factors, the prevalence of atrial fibrillation, the characteristics of patients. Out of those patients, 51 were randomized to uh, the left atrial appendage occlusion uh, study, 26 in the occlusion arm and 25 in the no occlusion arm. At the and the their, their conclusion was that the left atrial appendage occlusion can be safely performed during cardiac surgery. However, a large study as well needed to be uh, performed in order to assess its efficacy in reducing thromboembolic uh, uh, events and ischemic strokes. This is where the study that we're going to talk about today can, came into place. The layers three trial uh, targeted patients with history of atrial fibrillation undergoing cardiac surgery for another indication. The intervention was surgical left atrial appendage occlusion. They compared that with no occlusion of the left atrial appendage plus oral anticoagulation therapy. The outcome was protection. The outcome that was tested was protection, protection against ischemic stroke in addition to the protection provided already by anticoagulation therapy. The primary hypothesis of this study was that the risk of stroke or systemic embolism would be lower with the surgical occlusion of the left atrial appendage added to the usual care, which is oral anticoagulation therapy, than no occlusion plus uh, oral anticoagulation therapy. 
This study was a randomized parallel study. It took place in, from July 2012 to October 2018. It involved 105 centers and 25 countries. The total number of patients was 4,770 with a duration of follow-up of 3.8 years and the median uh, mean age of patients was 71 years. The inclusion criteria were patients who had a baseline history of atrial fibrillation who were undergoing cardiac surgery with cardiopulmonary bypass for another indication. And they, these patients have to have a chad vasque score of at least two or more. The exclusion criteria were off-pump surgery, mechanical valve implantation, heart transplantation, surgery for complex congenital heart disease, isolated implantation of an LVAD, previous surgery that involved opening the pericardium or previous implantation of a left uh, atrial appendage occlusion device, whether surgical or endovascular. There were four, there were, these were the methods that were approved for closure of the left atrial appendage during this study. They, they had to be included either by using a stapler or by cutting and sewing or amputation of the left atrial appendage and suturing the stump or by an approved epicardial device closure. Another method that is not shown in this picture is suturing the left atrial appendage within the atrium. These were the uh, approved methods for, for left atrial appendage occlusion. The outcomes that were measured, these are the, uh, the primary outcome was the first occurrence of ischemic stroke, including TIA with positive neuroimaging or non-cerebral systemic embolism during the follow-up. The secondary outcomes that were measured were stroke or non-cerebral systemic embolism, ischemic stroke, non-cerebral systemic embolism, death from any cause, 30-day mortality, the volume of chest tube drainage within the first 24 hours after surgery, re-exploration for bleeding within the first 48 hours after surgery, hospitalization for heart failure and myocardial infarction, and major bleeding. The these are the baseline characteristics of patients in the study. The mean age was 71, as previously mentioned. The males constituted 68% in the occlusion arm and 67% in the, in the no occlusion arm. As previously stated, all patients have to have atrial fibrillation as a baseline. 29% in both groups had permanent uh, atrial fibrillation. 46% in the occlusion had paroxysmal atrial fibrillation versus 49 in the no occlusion uh, group. The history of previous stroke was found in 9% across both arms, and 23% on the occlusion group had previous history of MI versus 24 in the no occlusion group. The, the chad -VASC score, the mean chad -VASC score across the two groups is 4.2. The, uh, the, uh, and the left ventricular rejection uh, fraction or left uh, less than 50% or left, vent left ventricular dysfunction was found in about 30% across the two groups. About half of these patients were on uh, oral anticoagulation, whether, whether with vitamin K antagonists or warfarin or direct anticoagulant. Uh, and about the other half were not receiving any anticoagulation at all. The most performed procedure during this study was actually valvular procedures, were valvular procedures across both groups, and CABID was only performed in 20% uh, in the occlusion arm versus 21.8% in the no occlusion arm. In the occlusion group, 89.6% eventually underwent left atrial appendage occlusion. 55% of those under, uh, had the cut and sew method, followed by 15% with a closure device, and 13% closure from within the atrium or suturing the left appendage within the atrium and the stapler was used in 11.2% of patients. The results of these trials showed that ischemic stroke occurred in about 4.8% in the occlusion group and 7% in the no occlusion group with a hazard ratio of 0.67 and a p-value of 0.001, which is significant. During the first day of the first 30 days after surgery, ischemic stroke was found in 2.2% in the occlusion group versus 2.7% in the no occlusion group. However, this was, this was not significant. And after 30 days, we can see that in the occlusion arm, 2.7% had strokes versus 46 in the no occlusion arm, with, which was quite significant, has a ratio of 0 0.58 and a p-value of 0 0.001. This shows that during the first 30 days, the risk of developing a stroke is quite similar between the two groups. However, after 30 days, the, no, the occlusion arm had a favorable outcome in regards to ischemic stroke or, or systemic thromboembolism. 
At hospital discharge, about 83% point, uh, 83% of participants of the occlusion group were receiving oral anticoagulation, and 81 in the no occlusion, 81% of the no occlusion group were receiving anti oral anticoagulation. At one year, the percentage was 79.6 in the occlusion arm versus 78.9, and at three years, it was 75.3 in the occlusion arm versus 78.2 in the no occlusion arm. This is this table shows the, the outcomes that we just talked about. The ischemic stroke, as previously mentioned, was found in 4.8% versus 7% in the no occlusion group uh, during the entire follow up period with a p value of 0.001 and hazard ratio of 0.67. The uh, ischemic strokes, uh, as we said, that ischemic strokes within the first 30 days were quite similar between the two groups 2.2 in the occlusion arm versus 2.2. 2.7 in the no occlusion arm. However, after 30 days, it was only 2.7 in the occlusion group versus 4.6 in the no occlusion group. Of note is the operative time. We can see here that there is no significant increase in the operative time in patients who had uh, left atrial appendage occlusion. The bypass time was 119 minutes in the occlusion group versus 113 minutes in the no occlusion group, a six minute increase with no significant statistical finding. The crush clamp time was also not significant, 86 minutes in the occlusion arm versus 82 minutes in the no occlusion arm. The median chest tube drainage uh, is was 520 milliliters in the occlusion arm versus 500 in the no occlusion arm, which is not significant. Reoperation for bleeding was also quite similar, 4% in the occlusion group versus 4% in the no occlusion group. The prolongation of uh, of hospital hospitalization due to heart failure is also not is not found to be significant across the two groups. This Kaplan-Meier curve also shows uh, what we talked about is that the uh, after the, during the entire follow-up period, the there is there uh, the there is a, uh, a the risk of developing thromboembolism in the occlusion group is 4.8 percent versus 7 percent in the no occlusion. So we can say that occlusion of the left atrial appendage redu reduces the risk of developing ischemic stroke by 33 percent which is quite significantly, uh, statistically significant. The subgroup analysis was consistent with the findings. There were no significant findings across all these groups, whether they were sex, age, presence or not of mitra, uh, rheumatic heart disease, type of oral anticoagulation, chad vask score, and so on. All these results were in favor of occlusion of the left atrial appendage. So uh, the LAOS-3 trial revealed that risk of stroke and arterial thromboembolism is lower with concomitant left atrial appendage occlusion during cardiac surgery than without it. The number of patients that are needed to undergo left atrial appendage occlusion to prevent one stroke over a five-year period is 37. So 37 patients need to undergo left atrial appendage occlusion to prevent one stroke. There was no significant increase in risk of heart failure, major bleeding, or prolonged operative time. Regarding heart failure, the, it was previously hypothesized that due to the fact that atria are rich in atrial nitritic peptide, which has a role in salt clearance and uh, water clearance from the kidneys, that removal of the appendage can result in heart failure. However, in this study, it was not found uh, that patients who underwent left atrial appendage occlusion developed heart failure. There was, uh, uh, this study uh, concluded that anticoagulation still is the main stay of thromboembolic prevention in atrial fibrillation. However, surgical left atrial occlu appendage occlusion does not replace oral anticoagulation. It only adds to the protective effect of, uh, of these oral anticoagulant drugs. The high rate of strokes that was, was, that was previously mentioned, which was found in the first 30 days, could be to uh, surgical factors itself. So, for example, patients who had to have their aortas manipulated or intracardiac manipulation could have been the cause of uh, the uh, strokes within a high rate of strokes within the first 30 days, which is, which is why after 30 days, the uh, patients in the occlusion arm had fewer strokes than patients who did not receive left atrial appendage occlusion. Uh, this study did not, as we said, did not compare left atrial appendage occlusion and oral anticoagulation. It only 
uh, only uh, stated that it adds a protective effect in addition to receiving oral anticoagulation and did not compare surgical left atrial aortic and uh, said left atrial appendage occlusion and percutaneous endovascular uh, occlusion of the left atrial appendage. Uh, limitations of this study is the lack of information about left atrial appendage occlusion compared to oral anticoagulation. This has to be studied in a different trial. They have to compare left atrial appendage occlusion and oral anticoagulation to see if surgical uh, appendage occlusion can replace oral anticoagulation in the future. And left atrial appendage occlusion was performed as a concomitant procedure, not as a standalone procedure, which means that patients had to have cardiac surgery for another reason than having atrial fibrillation, which begs the question that maybe perhaps in the future they can perform this type of procedure as a standalone procedure and, con and compare it to, uh, for example, uh, ablation procedures and, uh, uh, and, and uh, use of oral anticoagulation therapy. And this study, also one of the limitations, did not examine whether occlusion was sustained over the follow-up. Uh, so they did not uh, examine the occlusion site uh, with e echocardiography after the procedure was done. Uh, the conclusion of this trial is that this trial shows that among patients with atrial fibrillation who had undergone cardiac surgery for another indication, most of, those, most of those patients were receiving oral anticoagulation therapy. The risk of stroke or, or systemic embolism was lower with concomitant left atrial appendage occlusion performed during cardiac surgery than without it. These are my references, and thank you very much for listening, and if you have any questions. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sultan and Dr. Haytham. Thank you for this uh, very nice presentation and uh, comprehensive review of the, of the study about the, uh, the closure of the left atrial appendage in the cardiac surgery or during the cardiac surgery. Uh, I don't know if there is any question, but uh, if, there is, uh, if there is no question, I have a comment if it's possible. Hello. Hey, doctor. Uh, yeah, yeah, we, we all agree that uh, the closure of left atrial appendage during uh, cardiac surgery is yeah, almost a safe procedure and mm -hmm. to not add any yeah, uh, time to cross clamp. And uh, yeah, there is minimal complications. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I think for this study, Yanni, uh, you mentioned some limitation of the study, but uh, I think there is also another uh, uh, limitation or weakness in the, on this uh, study uh, that they did not differentiate between the stroke uh, 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 with either a primary or secondary outcome of the, of the study and below 30 days and after 30 days. Mm -hmm. They did not differentiate between the stroke caused by uh, left atrial thrombus versus extracardiac caused during the follow-up. Is yeah. there any, any mention in the study about the, 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 the difference between the stroke, the cause of the stroke for those patients uh, who underwent occlusion or closure of the left atrial appendage uh, during the surgery? Uh, for, no, to be honest, I didn't find that. I, I think they were most concerned with uh, left atrial appendage uh, thrombi, uh, thrombi was that were, were cardiogenic and originally. Mm -hmm. okay. um, the, uh, the other point is, um, yeah, I mean, just to concentrate that the, the, the point of uh, closure of the left atrial appendage yeah. is to prevent, to prevent the stroke yeah. or the decrease the incidence of a stroke. It's not to, to treat atrial fibrillation. So as you mentioned in your presentation, anticoagulation is the mainstay of medications even uh, after surgery. Uh, I have a question on this point also. Is there any mention in the study that for how many patients or the percent of patients who stop the anticoagulants after, after closure of the uh, left atrial appendage? Uh, Is there a mention? You mentioned some point. Yes, here on the slide, uh, at hospital discharge, as we said, that 
and the occlusion arm were receiving anticoagulation. At one year, it dropped down to 79%, and after three years, it was 75%. These are the patients who, were, uh, who had their left atrial appendage uh, occluded. Those patients and you reverted from atrial fibrillation into sinus. And uh, there was no mission. No, there was no mission. No but mission. it just says that they stopped taking some of these patients uh, evidently and they stopped taking their oral anticoagulation. Oh. Okay, this is my comment. Thank you very much, Dr. Sopan. And uh, I want to thank also Dr. Khalif and Dr. Ablaziz uh, and all the audience uh, for, and for me, it was an honor to attend this. Uh, High level presentation today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, no, no more question for Dr. Sultan. That is no more questions. Okay, thank you very much. I, uh, I don't know, I have to leave or I don't know what to do now. I believe we don't have any more questions. So thank you, oh. Dr. Sopan. And by this, we'll conclude our activity for today. Thank you very, thank much. You very much. Thank you.